Hello, everyone. Welcome to the National Humanities Center Scholarly Conversation for this evening. Thank you all for being here. My name is Tanya Muntz, and I'm the Vice President for Scholarly Programs here at the National Humanities Center. The title of today's event is Remembering Mussolini, Fascism, Representation, and Memory in Post-War Italy. The purpose of these events, of these conversations, is to highlight some of the excellent work that is being done by our fellows at the National Humanities Center. Each year we host up to 40 scholars from across the humanities and from across the world to spend the year or semester with us in pursuit of their projects. Since its founding, the center has hosted over 1,500 scholars and that time in residence here has resulted in over 1,600 books. For me, one of the most interesting parts of being here at the center is to see how sometimes serendipitously there's contact between different projects. Fellows are not selected on the basis of having actual overlap in the questions they're pursuing, but every year there's areas in which there's really productive and fertile conversation between scholars' projects. Today's event um, is being held as a conversation to give you a glimpse of this kind of work and the kind of overlap and the points of contact. We're talking about Italian fascism, memory and representation, an issue that really remains critically important. Um, at the end of sort of the more formal Q&A piece, we'll open it up to your questions and give you a chance to also engage in conversation with our two interlocutors, Simonetta Falasca Zamponi and Mia Fuller. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce them to you now. Simonetta Falasca Zamponi, to my immediate left, is professor of sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her extensive publications have focused primarily on the first half of the 20th century on fascism and the relationship between aesthetics and politics. Her award-winning book, Fascist Spectacle, The Aesthetics of Power in Mussolini's Italy, came out with UC Press in 1997 and examined this category of aesthetic politics to assess the role that symbols played in the construction of Mussolini's power. She's published extensively on the relationship between politics and aesthetics, including a second book titled Rethinking the Political, the Sacred Aesthetic Politics and the Collège de Sociologie that came out with McGill Queen's University Press in 2011 and which explored the history of the Collège during the 1930s, really at the height of fascism. This year at the center, she holds the Archie K. Davis Fellowship. The project she's working on focuses on the immediate years after the fall of the fascist regime in Italy, drawing on personal diaries and correspondence written by ordinary citizens between 1943 and 45. She examines how Italians experienced their present and negotiated their past during those critical years. Thank you for being here, Simonetta, and we look forward to learning more about your work. Mia Fuller, Fuller is Associate Professor of Italian Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. She is a cultural anthropologist and urban architectural historian whose research concerns the interplays between physical space and political power. She's published extensively on architecture and city planning in the Italian colonies, winning the International Planning History Society Book Prize for her book, Moderns Abroad, Architecture, Cities, and Italian Imperialism, which came out in 2006. She continues to write on Libya and Eritrea and the legacies of Italian colonialism there. Her current work focuses on the force or lack of force of old fascist symbols that still exist in Italy today, especially in the Pontina Martius area, where Mussolini's largest land reclamation project took place in the 1930s. This is a long-term project that she's been involved in. She's done over two decades of intermittent field work, as well as memory studies, the historical sociology of migration, oral history, and theories of monumentality. This year, Mia holds the NEH and Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship at the Center, and it's a privilege and a delight to have both of you here. Please join me in thanking and welcoming Simonetta and Mia Fuller. So to get us situated, um, both of you work on Italian fascism and its legacies, both immediately after Mussolini lost power in 1943 and really up until today, and how the legacy and memory were and continue to be negotiated by Italians. Mia, let me start with you. 
introduce us briefly, if you will, to the area that you're studying and how it came about. And you have the clicker I do, and I will to sh change the picture. Can everybody hear me? Yes? OK, good. So yes, I have been conducting off and on field work in this place and reading voluminously about this place. So the map on the left shows all of the land reclamation and sometimes settlement programs that were undertaken in the 1930s under fascism. So that's a bunch of dots. The current tally is 147 such uh, towns were built. So this was a, a major sort of part of the platform of fascism in the 1930s in Italy. The area called the Pontine Marshes, that is where the most dense concentration of dots <laughs> is on the map on the left, so south of Rome, if you know where Rome is in central Italy. Um, that is the area called the Pontine Marshes in English because it was marshy. It would be marshy today if not for the pumps that are still draining it. And it was very, very, very intensely malarial for centuries. So this was the, the insurmountable obstacle that Mussolini actually surmounted. It was a great claim to fame in the 1930s, internationally as well as in Italy. And a lot of scholars have worked on the place, the 300 square miles, as well as the five towns, 14 villages, 3,000 houses. However, almost every single piece of the scholarship stops at World War II as if sort of with the end of Mussolini there's the end of the program and what got me interested was that in fact the area is inhabited almost entirely by descendants of the settlers who were brought there by Mussolini who do not blend actually with the locals and who are still often vociferously pro Mussolini because you know he did well by them. So that's my fieldwork site. Um, I'm going to advance your slides and ask you to just take us a little bit okay. more into the actual detail of one of the areas you're, or one of the representations yes. you're studying. So there are a lot of ways to uh, write about this place, particularly if you do a lot, a lot of research. Um, how to tell the story of this place was a difficult process for me. And in the end, what really has captivated my attention the longest is not just the fact that the area is full of fascist monuments that are still there, that are unmodified. In one of the towns, not this one, there are actually newer monuments to fascism, which is a whole other rather shocking thing. But there is this one church in one town called Sabaudia, and this is the facade of the church, and then you can just see the, fres the, sorry, the mosaic, which is at the center of that facade. It's concave, so it's actually quite difficult to get a good photograph of, among other things. And it represents many things. It was put on the facade of the church in 1935. The church was built in 1934. It is dedicated to Mary of the Annunciation, because the church is. And Mary of the Annunciation was the favorite saint of the royal family at the time. That's well, well and good. And you can see Mary and above her, the Archangel Gabriel. So, so far, so conventional. And now I'm ready for the next slide, please. So, and then there's just this thing that there's Mussolini in the mosaic. And yes, so you giggle and that's, that's good. I'm always interested in how people react. <laughs> um, I'm still giggling, kind of, and it's been a, a long time. My project while I'm here is actually now very much about why is it that this particular representation of Mussolini in the public domain was never modified and was never hidden. The other ones that are in Italy, which I visit when I can, the, the, the ones you can see today other than this one, they were all masked or partly damaged or painted over and have been resurrected. This one has been constant and very visible. So I am interested in those particular aspects. And then, of course, I'm interested in the fact that uh, Mussolini is next to the belly of the Virgin Mary at the moment when she conceives the Son of, of God. So there are many things to explore about the composition of the mosaic. The last thing I'll say about it for now is that the image, it's not just that he's threshing wheat or he's feeding wheat into this mechanical thresher. That is taken directly from photographs taken on the 9th of July, 1934, when Mussolini, wearing that outfit, 
came to the area, sat on top of a red mechanical threshing machine, and did this very thing. So it is not simply or you know uniquely a, a, a sort of abstract, let's put Mussolini in the picture because he founded the towns. It is also a locally specific remembrance of his participation in the harvest. So I know you're interested in kind of monuments and how their valences and their charges change over the course of time. And um, I also know that you talk about how there was, it wasn't always safe, right? There was a moment in 1943 where maybe something could have happened to this. Take us quickly to that moment in 1943 where Mussolini loses power and then to the end of the war. What was the fate? of this fresco when well, so many other things were this, pulled down. This mosaic destroyed. is so strange or because, mosaic. in fact, nobody nobody harmed it. And Simonetta may have more to say about these things. So there's this moment Mussolini is, is removed um, from his prime ministership by the king, who's still the king at this point. But this is, this is the culmination of loss of faith in Mussolini in many quarters. Uh, the Allies, so we for the most part, have been bombarding cities in Italy, including Rome. And there's a, a sort of immediate unleashing of fury that very similar to when Saddam Hussein was deposed. I mean, sort of monuments are broken, torn down, so we have a lot of photographs of this. And in the in the case, this is part of why I'm so interested in this image, you, you might think that someone would even remove a tiny bit of the mosaic, but not at all. But the one thing we, we do know, that I know, uh, is that it's the priest who protected the mosaic, and I still find that very, very compelling, that the priest is protecting the fascist monument, we can come up with several explanations for that, um, but we'll just keep it simple. It was his church. But then, but then nothing happens to it, and there are complaints in the press, and then there are certain other things that kick in. This town is near a lovely beach. This may seem irrelevant, but in the 50s, so the era of La Dolce Vita, when Rome is this you know, hotbed of Hollywood on the on the Tiber, and so on. A lot of the people in the movie business and members of the intelligentsia in Rome like the beach near this town, and they have villas there. And they're the ones, in my view, who who really tolerate this Mussolini. They could have said he must be removed, but they decide to keep him. Okay, I am gonna. Um pull Simonetta into the conversation yes. as well, um, although I'm intrigued by the beach and the people who <laughs> allowed this to um, persist. Um, so this period, 1943 to 45, really is the central period of your project. And a lot happened in 1943, and I know those dates are important to what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Briefly, can you orient us to this time and what happens for Italians with respect to fascism, with respect to the war? Well, I mean, like, uh, you know, Mia just mentioned uh, on July 25th of 1943, uh, Mussolini uh, is, in a sense, deposed, right? He has to resign his position due to an internal rebellion, in a sense, um, from his own party. And that's the time that Mia was describing where um, Italians really kind of like, you know, uh, were moved by anger and rage and destroyed a lot of um, monuments, a lot, a lot of symbols, let's say, of fascism. Um, so there was that big moment. Um, and then, you know, this, this particular picture was saved, who knows, you know, maybe due to the priest. Uh, and maybe after that moment, you know, they moved on to something else, who knows, I don't know. But certainly that was a moment in which most of the uh, remnants, uh, you know, of whatever was, um, you know, uh, had a signature of the fascist regime was attacked and destroyed. Um, so between this time and the end of uh, April and beginning of May 1945, Italy is in this uh, state of, um, you know, uncertainty. Um, it's, you know, it's the end of the fascist regime, at least temporarily, um, but there is also a war going on with, you know, that uh, Mussolini had sided with the Germans against the Allies, and Italy is now in a very peculiar situation in which they have to decide um, in, to stay and 
continue fighting with the Germans or uh, do something else. Uh, and um, it's a very ambiguous um, time. There are many different ways to look at it and there are many ways in which, um, you know, both the king and um, the new governor, in a sense, who took the place of the new prime minister, took the place of Mussolini, kind of like played around. But eventually, um, Italy signs an armistice with the Allies. So Italy, well, signs an armistice. So, so far, so good, not really good. But people do think that maybe the war is over. But of course, it's not over. Uh, the Germans are quite taken by this um, change, of course. And, but Italy is still not quite officially saying what it's doing, right? And eventually, a month later, they declare war against Germany. So there is a whole, you know, three months almost of high uncertainty and uh, switching of sides. So it's a very difficult time uh, in which everybody is very confused, right? So now, all of a sudden, we go from one enemy to another. And that means also much more um, war damages because now uh, Italy becomes really um, the site of the Germans' um, revenge, in a sense. So Germany occupies Italy, so now the fights is, you know, the fights are within the country, everybody is involved, um, and this is really the, the time in which we see a lot of, um, you know, different reactions. So there is not enough time to react to fascism because you're immediately taken by a new war situation, which uh, Italy was already suffering from it. You know, the war had started in 1939. Um, Italy joined in 1940, it's already three years of war, and now it's, you know, the situation, instead of getting better, which was what Italians were hoping uh, for with the fall of Mussolini, things get worse. And so these are, you know, these three dates are the ones that are particularly interesting to see, you know, how people reacted. But it's until, you know, it then goes on until the war is over. Uh, but it's the time in which, you know, big changes are happening until in 1945, uh, you know, the, the war is over and the fascists, which had taken over some part of Italy, uh, are also defeated and so and there is a new course. So talk to us a little bit about how, I mean, your study is really about the lived experiences of people during this tumultuous time. Talk to us a little bit about the sources that you're using and what kinds of things that you're finding. Well, it's kind of interesting because uh, at the beginning, I was uh, looking more at cultural production. I was interested in, in the ways in which uh, culture uh, was um, you know, portraying these times. And, uh, but then eventually I happened to, um, to know about a couple of archives in Italy which uh, deal with uh, what we could translate in English as uh, folk writing, folk or popular writing. And um, there were a couple, one in Northern Italy, uh, which is called the um, archive of folk writing, and one in uh, central Italy, in Tuscany, which is now has a bigger name, um, which is um, National Diary Archive. And uh, in these two archives, I found um, diaries, and I thought that um, that could be an interesting way to look at the issue I was interested in, which was you know, what happened in these two years, um, and especially what happened to uh, the Italians' feelings and uh, understanding of the regime when all of a sudden, for 20 years of fascism, you know, the whole thing fell apart. And my interest was uh, mostly in trying to understand contemporary Italy kind of Italy's normalization 
or let's put it in very neutral term, of some aspects of fascism. Um, the fact that I was surprised that um, there wasn't so much of a critical approach to fascism among uh, you know, the popular press uh, especially. And there was this uh, rehabilitation, if you want, of Mussolini. All of a sudden you found uh, videotapes and uh, memorabilia for sale. Um, and uh, you know, I started wondering if um, the kind of response Italians gave right after the fall might give us a sense of why after 60 years uh, we, we had this kind of a return of fascism, uh, not in terms of the regime, but kind of like, uh, you know, people's um, uh, curiosity about it without having the critical uh, tools to actually, um, you know, define what this regime had been and what had meant uh, for, you know, in Italian history. Um, and so these diaries, um, in a sense, gave me the tool, the analytical tool, to look at some of these issues because I wasn't interested in um, talking to Italians who were still surviving about what they remembered because I think memory, of course, I mean, we know it's, uh, um, it's a tricky, uh, it's a tricky thing. I mean, you remember some things, not others, you remember differently. It's hard to trust, right? I mean, it's, uh, uh, you need to have many other tools in order to figure out um, how people are, uh, are remembering. And so the diaries gave me uh, the means to really see how people reacted at the moment in which these events were occurring. I mean, of course, nothing is, uh, you know, immediate. There is always, I mean, the moment you write, it's already a medi mediating, right, means. I mean, you're already reflecting. So we're not excluding the fact that this is not just authentic experience, right? Uh, it's something that people, um, you know, think through, but still it was pretty much maybe a few hours after the event they were writing these thoughts, so. And so I know you're also interested in absences and what kinds of things people are skipping over um, and ambivalence in these documents. Right. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you're finding in these diaries and how people are talking about or what they're not writing about? Right, so the moment I found uh, diaries, which were, you know, all very different and all very, uh, you know, in terms both of the, the, how much they wrote or, you know, when they were writing, um, I thought that I should try and find some ways to compare them. And so to have a measure of, you know, so that it wasn't just my interpretation of what I was uh, reading. So I decided to focus on the three dates I just mentioned earlier and to see, you know, if people were writing on those dates and what they were writing. So from that point of view, the issue of omission is the fact that sometimes, strangely enough, many of these diaries and many of these people were writing so much did not write anything, for example, on July 25th, when fascism <laughs> fell. Uh, so that is kind of like really food for thought, right? What is happening? Uh, what does it mean? And of course, then you have to connect, you know, the story to other parts of their diaries. But at least that gave me kind of a, a basis, a foundation to see how people, you know, all these diaries I was uh, reading reacted in this particular, uh, on this particular date. So again, to have a, a measure of, you know, uh, of comparison, because um, like I say, you know, diaries are all very different and unique, but at least that way I could have some kind of a, um, the ability to, to interpret these, um, you know, silences. And of course, I mean, you cannot just interpret in the sense of, oh, this person didn't feel anything or didn't have anything. To, you know, it could be trauma. I mean, it could be something, um, you know, something 
not necessarily negative in the sense of support for fascism. In fact, I think supporters might have been even more eager to write about what you know the the end meant. But it's um, it's interesting to me uh, in order to really understand the place of fascism in Italians' lives, because I think one of the big puzzles um, is, is really what it actually meant to Italians to live under fascism, and or uh, the fact that they lived these three, I mean, two very uh, troubling years, in a sense, and that's my issue, um, kind of like put aside the problem of 20 years of fascism, because the, the war events were so uh, much more, you know, present, much more uh, present, and you know, it was hard probably for them to even reflect back on what 20 years had been under fascism. Uh, they were much more taken by the immediacy of, you know, an everyday life that was pretty much determined by, um, you know, trying to find food. Um, you know, Italy was suffering uh, a lot under the war. Uh, bombings, you know, trying to uh, find shelter, moving, you know, leaving the cities. So they were living some kind of, uh, you know, much more kind of like life, um, life issues that, that they, in a sense, kind of like stop them from even thinking about what 20 years uh, had been. And that, I think, is my big puzzle. So what, what can we make of these silences? How much uh, also these silences, um, you know, determine the future of how they thought about these past years? Um, Mia, I'm going to shift us to where you talk about, you are interested in figuring out exactly where there is affect and what kind of still has a charge and what it has become kind of neutral, like the picture in Sabaudia that you shared with us. And you offer this great continuum of kind of dead as a doornail to the other end of the spectrum, which is dangerously crowd stimulating affective charge of a monument. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you think uh, makes something charged today and what would make something just tolerated or oblivious or just not have that affective charge? Yes, yes, I could. Um, that's kind of the entire project yeah. right there, so <laughs> I may not summarize it very succinctly. Um, so the, the premise of the book is that this mosaic was not only not damaged at the time, but that in particularly in recent decades has become meaningless. And if you're a foreigner, I mean, if you're me, and you arrive, you think, oh! so that really was my first reaction and my 10th reaction and my 100th reaction. But I, I'm, I'm sure that most people, certainly the locals are not reacting this way. They find it very dull. They don't want to talk about it. They would like it to go away. It would be more trouble to remove it uh, than to just leave it there. So in a way, it's invisible to them. Also, no Italian pilgrims, fascist pilgrims, are coming to visit it. And that's really important because in the meantime, in particularly the last couple of decades, and especially now, in Italy there are fascist pilgrims and neo-fascist pilgrims. There's a whole sort of gray to black rainbow of fascist pilgrims um, who are going to certain places. Most notably, best known is uh, the thousands of people who visit Mussolini's tomb which is in a crypt inside a building in the cemetery in the same town where he was born, so it's kind of not far from Bologna. I mean, it's sort of northeast relative to, to this area. Um, and that, so, so part of my project is to look at these things through contrast. 
So I can say with certainty that the picture of Mussolini in Sabaldia, which is an image commemorating a local event, has no charge because no one goes to look at it. No one is excited about it except me, frankly. And at the same time, if I go to the town nearby where they make, they've made new monuments since the year 2000 and they have restored monuments that were damaged in 1943, now there I know I am in a more pro-Mussolini town and there are many other forms of material and visual evidence from photographs to temporary posters and of course I've been interviewing people all along. So even in this one area there's a, there's a sharp contrast and the people of these towns will compare their towns to each other. And then along this wider spectrum, because I'm using other Italian sites, Predapio, the hometown and crypt site, for Mussolini's remains is, is actually now, even more than 20 years ago, a very pronounced contrast because of the literally thousands of people who are going every year, who are signing the register, who are saluting, who are chanting, who are parading, who are wearing black shirts. There is a law prohibiting this, but it's not a very strong law. Um, and there you can get all the memorabilia you want and more. Um, so, so from my perspective, there is first of all a, a spectrum, and then there's the question of, well, what, what makes the difference? Part of what makes the difference is, in the case of the Sabaudia mosaic, it, it really is the fact that this is a local picture at some level. And then there are other circumstances, like these people with their beach houses, who are all left-wing intelligentsia, but Pasolini, the famous writer, poet, filmmaker, and intellectual authority for many people on the left in Italy, he himself said, oh, we laugh at these fascist towns. This fascist architecture makes us laugh. From his perspective in 1973 or 1974, capitalism was much more frightening. The future of capitalism was much more frightening than this past fascism. We can look at this today and think that in a way he wasn't wrong and at the same time that was complacent. So he articulates this sentiment of we can keep these little fascist towns with their cute Mussolini pictures because they are now harmless. We, we have won. So that's kind of one stage and there are other things that happen in this town but a lot of people go there. It's not the other town called Latina, none of my friends in Rome will ever visit me when I'm there. I do not have a friend in Rome, which is an hour and 15 minutes away, who will set foot in Latina because it's so notoriously, disgustingly fascist. But they've all been to Sabaudia because the beach is nearby. So that's one way you sort of cleanse the charge. I'm very interested in the recharge though, right? How do you keep something meaningful? Well, the thousands of people visiting Mussolini and his crypt, there every time they salute, they chant, they sign the book, they buy the memorabilia, and they leave ex votos, so they're full of ex votos. That place has charge. It has charge because now you could even mention it to someone predisposed in some other place and they will know what it means. And they're New monuments that are more or less successful. There was a new monument a few years ago, a mausoleum made to Italy's most important war criminal of the 20th century, Rodolfo Graziani, um, who died with, you know, he died in a hospital bed. I mean, he was not tried for war crimes. He's a, he's a really notorious figure for the genocide, in, the attempted genocide in Eastern Libya and various other bloodshed. Um, but the people in his hometown thought it would be really good a few years ago to use some public funds to build a mausoleum on, in his honor. Um, it, obviously, there was a terrible backlash. People were charged and even convicted because they've been using public funds. I'm very interested in this as, a, as, as an opposite end case because they meant to honor him, but in a way, he was discussed more as a negative figure in Italy because of this monument that they made to him. So they, it can cut both ways. It can also be a kind of anti-charge. So this is, this is kind of the zone, the zone I'm working in. Again, I don't have a fully succinct answer to the conditions because in each case it's kind of different. So 
I know that in a recent piece that you've written, you talk about a project that's being planned, a museum to fascism in Predapayo, right? Yes. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Almost. Predapayo. Okay. Yes, me dispiace. And you, in this piece, make kind of a more active intervention or recommendation for how the, the complicated memory of fascism, and in particular Mussolini, ought to be handled. And you look at the case of Germany and other cases, and sort of to prevent uh, this becoming a site that becomes, again, very charged affectively, can you help us understand what, how you think this very complicated issue ought to be handled by this town? So now we're in just that town, only in that town. I wouldn't generalize. But so yeah, I broke all the cardinal rules of all of my training uh, and surprised myself by writing an article that ended up being an article that says, this is what people should do. And normally I wouldn't do that. And I also I keep in mind that I am not Italian. I mean, I'm not a citizen. I speak differently as a citizen of the United States about American situations. So I, I really, I do try to draw that line. However, I wrote this article and there it just came tumbling out. So the town of Predapio, which has these pilgrims and all these people who come through, but it has a socialist mayor, but it's all a little bit ambiguous because after all, the main business of the town is selling memorabilia. It's a, it's a tense place. I mean, I, I've been quite a few times and it's tense no matter which way you, you cut it. People are tense, uh, even when they're selling you all kinds of keychains and uh, earrings. There are Mussolini earrings that you didn't know you needed. Um, so, but. There is the biggest building in the town, the tallest building, and it's on the big piazza, is the fascist party headquarters built in the 20s. Actually, the whole center of the town was redone in the 1920s on Mussolini's orders by one of the principal architects who worked in the Italian colonies. So it's also not the town it was when he was born there or grew up there. But so there's this tall, towering building with a tower, and it's very imposing, and you know what it is just by looking at it. It's the fascist party headquarters. And it's been vacant for a long time, understandably. And the proposal is to turn the building into a museum of fascism. So about two years ago is when this became quite publicized. And they have a 200-page project, and they've hired a team of designers, and it's partly about restoring the building. But there was certainly an uproar to some degree in the press, but very much among historians. And um, so what distinguishes me, one of the things that separate me from those historians, many of whom are very good friends of mine and whose work I admire, is that I do field work. And so none of them mentioned, and this is what got me going, none of them mentioned the fact that in addition to the town and the crypt, so there's the house where he was born, you can visit, there's the crypt, you can visit, there's the church, it's got the fascist party emblem, it's got the Fasquez on the facade. Um, but about five miles away is the house that Mussolini owned and where his wife, he and his wife lived there with the kids, all of the kids, the five children spent some part of their growing up years there and they held on to it. And after the war and after Mussolini died with his mistress, uh, the widow, Rachele, lived in the house. She died in the house in 1979. So this is a really uh, erratic cultic place. The true uh, faithful, really, the true devotees don't just go and visit the crypt, they go to visit the house. So this was really a part of the point of the, the article, which has not even appeared yet, was, first of all, this has to be taken into account. You can't really just say, we're going to have a museum of fascism in this building over here. It's not going to do anything at all. And the other thing is that in nowhere in the discussions of the museum was there any hint of how Mussolini himself would be discussed. And this is this is kind of the, the key item. Italians in general, and this is in many ways continuous since the period Simonetta is writing about, the ambivalence about Mussolini is, is a kind of permanent institutional part of, of life, right? You, almost everybody's heard the line about, you know, he made the trains run on time. I mean, 
there are all these ways in which Italians will privilege some aspect of life under the regime or the outcome of life under the regime. So there are certainly Italians who will just condemn Mussolini altogether, but basically it's always a very confused subject. Uh, people talk about him a lot. It's very different from Hitler in Germany where there's kind of one main story and then there's a little side story. Uh, but in Italy, it's actually much more complex, and, and it depends on who you're talking to, class position, gender position, what happened to grandma. It, there are all kinds of factors that are part of the, the kind of discussion of Mussolini. The fact that there is not, so here's, here's the kicker, there is no national museum in Italy that depicts fascism, not one. There is no official representation of Mussolini. There are all these different little local museums, and I visit them uh, when I can. And so we get different facets of Mussolini. There's a sort of shattering of, I actually call it splintering. I discuss the splintering of Mussolini because there are different local Mussolinis. So the Mussolini who's holding the wheat, that's a local splinter of Mussolini. Um, very much like local saints' images. There's a, there's a kind of connection there in terms of cultural patterns, but there is no national official story about Mussolini, which is why I got, I got a little testy in the article I was writing and said, you know, that's fine, you want to have a museum of fascism, but you really have to talk about Mussolini and the cult of Mussolini, which is being practiced in this very town. So this kind of ambivalence that's present today that allows for this fraction, for these different kind of versions of Mussolini to either be tolerated or, or less so. Simonetta, talk to us a little bit about how that ambivalence is found in these diaries or what the reactions are at the time. And maybe we can extrapolate exactly to how Italy, kind of this lack of reckoning in some ways or unified reckoning. Right. Um. You know, it's again a very hard question to probe, right? I mean, that's where most historians have failed when they try to figure out what Italians thought about fascism under the regime, right? It was impossible to, to understand. I mean, people, it, it was a dictatorship after all, so you cannot really, you know, know what people are thinking or saying, so you, know, you try to read, uh, uh, you know, between the lines, but it's very, very hard. So you think that the moment the, the, you know, the regime falls, people have some more confidence uh, in what they uh, can say. And that was the idea about, you know, what you can find in the diaries. And, um, you know, it's, it's very um, interesting that, um, you know, the sample of diaries, and I mean, I read more than a hundred diaries. Um, of course, you know, the number seems huge, but some of them are a few pages, some of them are, you know, real big uh, books. Uh, th there is a certain inconsistency. Um, in a sense, some people really, you know, there is, for some people, certainly it's a moment of joy, but it's also a, because of the situation I was describing earlier, um, it's also a moment in which they feel like, oh, what's gonna happen next, right? I mean, what does it mean? The, the joy, uh, a lot of the joy, it's very clear, is uh, linked to the fact that people think war is gonna be over. With the end of Mussolini, we, you know, we stop fighting, which wasn't the case. It couldn't have been the case. So these reactions are mixed, so it's hard to understand if they're happy because Mussolini is gone or, and the regime is gone, or if they're happy because they're hoping into something else, you know. And eventually they figure out that the war is still there. And, um, and then the reactions about the regime, again, I mean, about Mussolini are mixed. But the regime is, um, you know, it was corrupt. There was already that idea that the regime was corrupt. And they never, and people could never figure out what place Mussolini 
uh, what role he played within this corrupt system, right? It seems also like he didn't know what was happening. So there is always this kind of uh, separation. For some people, it's like surprise that, uh, you know, that somebody, a dictator, could end that way. You know, it, it was a very strange way to end the dictatorship. I mean, he just had to resign, and he was uh, you know, pretty much put in jail. I mean, it wasn't like a revolution. It wasn't like, you know, uh, a, f a violent fight. It was just a very, um, a very unusual turn of circumstances. And um, at some point, you see that it's very hard. I mean, after all, we can't expect that from one moment to the next, people are just like, you know, going from one sense of, you know, being to another. And um, it's hard, I think, for people even to switch that fast to a new reality that, you know, after, again, 20 years of, of fascism. Um, so you see that, you know, during the armistice, again, um, people are really more concerned about the war. I mean, they're not, uh, they can't think about fascism, they can't be, uh, think about what it has been because they think about their present, and the present is very dire. And, and so the, the idea is more like, so what, you know, what is the situation, what are we doing? And, um, and in a sense, so the end of, of fascism didn't end the problems uh, for Italy. And the way also eventually, um, uh, you know, that Italy was involved in uh, trying to, uh, you know, push back the Germans became, you know, a, a war of liberation from foreign occupants, um, occupier or whatever you want to call it. And so at that point, it really, um, the focus from moved away from fascism, from the regime, was like a war against the Germans. It was a, um, a uh, you know, a, a war against a real physical presence of some, you know, of the enemy. Uh, which, of course, had lots of links with what fascism had been. Um, but, you know, there were too many layers. And I think that's where some of the ambivalence that we still see today um, uh, developed. It's this sense of there's no separation between, you know, fascism, what it had been, and uh, what uh, would come in the future. And it's kind of interesting that I just, uh, a colleague, a uh, historian, an independent scholar in Italy, just did uh, a survey of young people in a specific town in Italy about fascism. And it's one of the first and only, I think, um, uh, surveys, and he interviewed more than 800 uh, young people, and the results are quite interesting. You know, on the one hand, um, only 50 percent think that they know about fascism, and on the other hand, a large percentage, especially about males, uh, do not necessarily think there was anything wrong with fascism. Yeah. So now we really have, you know, yeah. some kind of uh, evidence that, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, ambiguity uh, about that time period. So this, um, this is going to be my final question, then we'll open it up, and that is about today. When both of you read the news, when we think about Europe, but really about the world, and there's a kind of rise of the right, there's movements towards illiberalism um, in various places in the world. What can we learn from fascism, and where do the parallels break down, or maybe even do us more harm than good? But what is it? What does this time tell us about some of the the forces we're facing today? Big question. See, when I don't want to go first. What does it tell us? Um, well, you know, I mean, it's, um, it's again, complicated because, as you know, there, there's a lot of invocation about this is fascism, this is fascism, right? But historians and political scientists will tell you what this is not fascism, right? I mean, so what, 
what can we say? Uh, it's right wing, the right wing movements, it's, you know, um, populism, nationalism. Uh, they're all bad. It doesn't mean that it's because we don't call them fascists that they're not bad. But um, from a historical perspective, they do not uh, reflect, you know, what uh, what fascism was. I mean, first of all, in, you know, in terms of, of really like, uh, you know, a dictatorship, um, uh, you know, one party system, uh, or not even. <laughs> um, so there are ways in which, um, you know, it might not be necessarily useful to talk about what is happening today in terms of fascism. But at the same time, I mean, from the historical, you know, from you know, the way one can define a system. Uh, certainly, most historians will not agree that what we are witnessing is fascism. But at the same time, clearly there are signs, there are, uh, you know, there are eerie uh, resonances with what fascism uh, was or the kind of positions it took. So I think that from that point of view, politically, it might be useful to use the term fascism because it attracts more attention, because uh, people pay more attention, because it is, uh, it scares us more, and, and rightly so, because um, after all, you know, the, uh, the way fascism happened uh, in Europe uh, was pretty much something unexpected, right? It was a new phenomenon, so nobody was thinking that it will end up that way. Um, and, you know, in both the cases of Italy and Germany, um, it wasn't, again, a revolution. Um, they were pretty much part of the governmental um, coalition uh, for, at least at the beginning. So it's, it, can, it can turn, you know, in, in, in different directions, and, uh, and so it would be, uh, important, I think, to be vigilant and to learn some lessons about, um, you know, the ideologies of these movements and and uh, and the kind of uh, uh, disregard for uh, human rights, for um, human will. Uh, I mean, there are many aspects that I think culturally are part of fascism in terms of. I think uh, the political system, there are differences. Right. Well, I, I agree with everything Simonetta has just said, just as a starting point. Um, when I teach fascism in, in my classes, I, I always approach it in terms of what were the conditions that made it feasible for this new political form to develop? Um, not necessary conditions, but sufficient conditions. So because this is the one place where different scholars, different analysts, historians, political scientists, and so on, can converge in their discussions. Currently, some of the, so the populist movements that we're hearing a lot about share, I mean, some of those conditions are in place now, and I think that this is a lot of why the eerie resonance leads people to promptly say, oh, it's, it's fascism, it's just like fascism. There are some very important differences. Uh, fascism was born in Italy, and without the recency of World War I and the veterans who had just returned, there wouldn't have been what we now call fascism, maybe something else, but the liturgy, the outfits, the attitude, the violence, those are all things that can be connected. I mean, just you draw a straight line from the returning veterans to these events within a year, two years. This is not a condition that's in place today, for instance, right? So there, so you can sort of analyze it in, in these terms. From my personal perspective in terms of the work I'm doing, what, what really got me interested was the idea, I mean, and this is the American end of my project, even though I'm not going to write about it in my book about Italy, is how can it be that a 
particular flag or a particular monument that everyone has been ignoring for a long time, even though I might be shocked if I drive into town and I see it and I, I might find this quite surprising. But how can it be that from one day to the next, we give it, we attribute power to it? It becomes dangerous. Now the Confederate flag is dangerous. Now the, so I'm not opposed. I would like those things to go away as well. But I'm very interested in that, that turning point. How does that happen? Are these symbols really so powerful? And then, if they are, then we do need to think about the continuities or the revivals of fascism. So now, speaking about Italy, so I've been going to Predapio, Mussolini's hometown, for long enough that I can say that people are responding when they go and in the gift shops and so on to the same symbols, but they are different people. Now they're white supremacists. But 10 years ago, they were not. So this is also important. I think the continuity of symbols matters. I haven't quite figured out all the ramifications of how. And then the last thing I'll say about this is, yes, I do think we do ourselves a disservice if we simply decide that this is fascism. This may be a lot more scary than fascism. <sighs> I'll stop there. Um, I'll stop with we'll that. And we'll stop there <laughs> and open it to your questions. Andrade, oh, our library director, is going to come um, around with the mic. On the basis of your the reading of diaries and, and interviews, what about fascism appealed broad? I know it's a complex, but what were some of the central things that appealed and continue uh, to appeal uh, fascism and Mussolini? If you can, those are separate symbols. I'll go first. Um, there, there was a, a phrase in circulation a lot right around 1918, 1920, 21 in Italy, leading up to 1922 when Mussolini becomes prime minister and then dictator. And the phrase was return to order. Um, that is certainly one of the most important themes that had a lot to do with putting people back in their socioeconomic place. Um, there was a sort of internal almost civil war between uh, le left wing and right in Italy right between the end of World War I and the rise of Mussolini to the prime ministership. Uh, very, very violent. A lot of bloodshed in various parts of, of Italy. But So the fascism was sort of the pushback. Uh, the peasants should remain peasants. The people working the factories should, you know, not claim any sorts of rights. So that was part of it. I think um, what really attracted people about fascism, uh, what fascism or oh, Mussolini managed to do successfully was to give Italian, Italians the sense of, um, of conquest of being success, uh, successful again with the, you know, the, the colonies and going to war, uh, going to, to successful wars. Uh, at least, you know, in appearance, those were successful wars in Ethiopia uh, when, you know, Italy declared uh, Ethiopia part of its empire. Um, this idea of grandeur uh, in my in my opinion, really took roots much more than one thinks, and it emerges from the diaries, though you know in a very no, very surreptitious way, but it does. Uh, and I think since war, in, in my opinion, was at the heart of really of fascism, uh, was the you know engine that moved all the pieces. Uh, in a sense, that was a successful, um, you know successful um, objective that, uh, that Mussolini really reached, I'm, I'm quite convinced. Uh, good afternoon. Two con uh, questions arising out of Madeleine Albright's book last year called Fascism. Um, one is that um, 
uh, maybe uh, you could comment on the fact that surely democracy and communism and other styles of governing, like fascism, have their different species of, of the genus, and so not one size fits all. But she draws on, in that book, on growing up in what she saw uh, her own fascist Europe bringing, and, and says, and I think develops the thesis that uh, the current regime in this country is sh beginning to show the signs of the preparation that uh, these other European last century leaders started to show. And so she sees and wants to draw attention to the scary signs of the evolving or developing fascism uh, without knowing what the conclusion may be. And I guess none of us know what's in his mind and whether this is active and, and purposeful or just there's a coincidence. But uh, I, I'm fascinated by those two things in, in the varieties of fascism and, in, and whether she's right in drawing attention to the emerging characteristics of at least the dogmatic leadership the, of, of not being interested in anything else than your own views. Mm. Is this uh, Albright? Madeline Albright. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, I was just reading a review of her book and, um, and, and really there is a lot of resistance about the way she talks about fascism and, and people are really saying somewhat she seems to take by fascism, everything that it can be just scary, simply scary. Um, and again, um, you know, like I said earlier, I think it makes sense if this, uh, you know, directs people's attention to some of the issues that certainly are very important, like, you know, freedom of the press, if you want, uh, it's a big issue. Um, you know, people's rights, human rights, I mean, you know, minorities, uh, conditions of minorities and all that. I think that one, uh, and you know, I don't know where I read somewhere that fascist is one of the worst, um, uh, you know, things you can, um, you can use in terms of, you know, pejoratives to address people, right? And I, I mean, in a sense, I think we have to take it that way. But in terms of historical, uh, you know, movements of fascism, um, many historians would make the case that one important characteristic of fascism, of fascist, you know, at least the way it, it emerged in Italy, because Italy was the first country, uh, right, that uh, established fascism, was also this really this idea of uh, changing, uh, creating a new person. This idea of completely remaking the person. There was, um, you know, what I call the totalitarian tendency, which is this idea of not just governing, it's not just an authoritarian form of government. It's a form of government that has some kind of uh, vision, if you want, um, of remaking the world. And I think this was, you know, for some historians of fascism, they call it, uh, you know, in, a, in different ways, but there is this impulse of creation which um, really defines both Mussolini's, uh, uh, you know, uh, vision of how Italy should change, and certainly Hitler. And this, if you want, I use this uh, aesthetic idea of politics, which I think really define those movements. Even if, um, you know, once we eliminate those and, and we are left with the skeleton, we can still call it fascism, but it's. Um, I think it's only some aspects of it. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I still continue to believe that it's um, there are two different things. Yes. Um, again, I agree with everything Simonetta says. Um, historians would, I mean, a, a historian of Italian fascism or National Socialism will inevitably say, well, this is different, right? It's different because the conditions are different, because the goals are different, because we're in a different kind of economic universe, uh, because the economies were very, very important. However, um, this being said, I, um, fascism is a word that, I mean, I associate it with teenagers yelling at their parents, 
You know, when you want to say to somebody, you're a bully, you're pushing me around, you're not the boss of me, you call them a fascist. So this is in the vernacular now, and that is where I would place the, the, the gesture of writing a book titled Fascism to say we are living in a dangerous, precarious moment, which I think is what the book is about. Um, so that, so in a way, I think we have to have sort of fascism A, fascism B, right? The, the fascism B being the vernacular term that's really about today and the future. I mean, it is it overlaps with the origin in the sense that it really is about thuggery. Um, the original fascists were thugs. That's they were squadristi. I mean, they they were thugs who roamed the countryside in various parts of northern Italy setting buildings on fire and torturing members of the Socialist Party. That is the, the origin of Italian fascism. And then a sort of, sort of, I'll say sort of, political philosophy was tacked onto it. So we recognize, everybody recognizes thuggery. And in that respect, I'll, I'll agree with it. And I think things are scary, in case I didn't make that clear before. <laughs> Getting back to Italy and all the symbols that still remain, you have Milan, Milano Centrale, you have all the nobili that have been filled in, all the things, the malaria that was got rid of because of that, and these whole monuments, these cities, North Italian cities are sort of monuments to uh, fascism. Uh, the monument at Monte Grappa, you know, the big war monument there, and uh, and people, uh, you know, that's part of the infrastructure of people's social culture. Mm -hmm. uh, so these monuments remain as part of Italian art. Um, and so, and yet so many Italians uh, don't want to get involved with politics at, at some level because they've had enough. Mm -hmm. And this, and then the separatism. I mean, you have so many levels. How do you see all this in the future of Italy, and the desensitization of people to politics because they've been through so much that they can't take any more? Um, wow. <laughs> I mean, I, I personally am not making any predictions about the future, or you know, not even tomorrow. So <laughs> I don't see this in terms of the future. I will agree that, I mean, every city in Italy has buildings ranging from schools to hospitals to ministry buildings uh, that were built under the fascist regime. It was an extraordinarily vast uh, public works program. So just to begin with, Italy can't afford to get rid of fascist buildings. Just, that's it. Secondly, now it's been enough generations that most people don't really think, oh, it's a fascist building. Although in my generation, what I've seen is Italians saying they hate fascist architecture, except that one building. So, th so there's a kind of re-aestheticization of some sites, and this is an argument that's going on in Italy at this very moment. People are fighting about whether certain things should still be standing, but even that, in my terms, is a, a kind of re-inscription, re-labeling, you know, I don't like this building because it's too fascist, but I like this one because it's good architecture. There's a lot of that. So it's not as fascist because the architecture is good. Um, but. But what's happening in Italy today is also so frightening that talking about buildings is kind of a fun diversion for most Italians, I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. And from the point of view, you could say, you know, again, it's not fascism, but it's awful. Uh, so, you know, if we want to call it fascist, let's call it that way if that means that it's really bad. But it is bad. Yeah, and I agree, you know, even uh, about what we were saying in 1943, there was this moment, you know, after July 25th, in which, uh, you know, Italians got rid of everything that reminded them of fascism. But there was, you know, a, a reaction at the moment, you know, on, on the spot. And, and after that, you know, sure, there could be some things that remind them of fascism, but it wasn't as important any longer. You start coexisting with things, even if, right, I mean, they are not necessarily um, 
something you agree with or they lose that, that, that meaning because meaning is created you know not necessarily by the content but by the situation by the context right so I mean there are many things that we go around that we don't realize or and then all of a sudden we realize them and 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 so the, the you know the building itself or the station in Milan I mean you know now when people can just look and say wow what an interesting <laughs> architecture right and not think about uh, when it was built and, and how and what. Um, so yeah, uh, certainly symbols at the moment are the least of problems for Italy. <laughs> Although, by the way, I will say inside the Milan train station, there is a portrait of Mussolini, but it's damaged. So that's one of the, and I, I, I'm interested in these faces of Mussolini that were partly damaged. You can still see that it's him, but look, we don't like him anymore, except we left him there. So that's, the Milan train station is one of them. We have time for one more question. Uh, well, I think it's me, because I've got the microphone. Um, I think this is an interesting juxtaposition between diaries which are very personal uh, statements and commentaries and monuments which are the epitome of public statements uh, and I would like to get from the both of you uh, some sense of uh, the difference between the two how personal were the diaries how much were they straightforwardly honest how did they write in code if necessary um, and similarly, I was interested in your frisson of astonishment at uh, the idea of a fascist priest uh, when uh, the Catholic Church is full of them. Uh, we do have the Crociate Italica, uh, which is a group of Italian fascist priests. But the priest who uh, looks after that mural, is he looking after it as a monument to Mussolini, or does he think it's been anointed by God now? Because most iconography in the church is deemed to have got that element to it. And if I can just say as one final point, we do have to thank whichever hurricane it was for postponing this uh, talk so that the regents at the UNC could propose spending five million dollars on a building to house a fascist monument. Thank you. I was waiting for that actually. <laughs> um, in terms of diaries, uh, you know, one thing I didn't probably mention earlier was that um, you could think of diaries as two different kinds of sets, right? Diaries that people uh, wrote at the time with probably, you know, a very good idea that they could be published, that they would be published. And there are a few that came out right after, you know, 45, 46 of, you know, more educated people. Now the diaries I'm looking at, most of them, not all of them, are of what we might call ordinary people, right? So people who uh, don't write too well, don't necessarily are expected to be writing diaries, uh, and, um, and, and pretty much uh, follow their own conventions, right, in the way they write. And like I said, some people write very little, some people write a lot. Um, I think one of the dangers when we have, you know, diaries or you know, subjects is to romanticize them, to think that what they say, it's what they feel, it's authentic, it's the real voice of the people. And I try not to go along that path. And I'm really trying to look at them not as, um, you know, the personal individual life of this specific people who are writing the diary, but trying to see them uh, to contextualize them as voices uh, that might uh, give us a sense of the kind of gap there was between what I would call official consciousness and practical consciousness of what people, how people, how you know, events were defined and how people lived them. So this kind of uh, clash or tension 
of things that are not said, not just because they're not written, but because they are you know, in the process of being experienced by the people themselves. So that's the way I look at diaries, even if they are personal and individual. Uh, you know, to me, they can give us a sense of the ambivalence of the time. That's a, such a good question about different materials uh, and, and different interpretations. Um, so I, I was thinking, I should just start by saying, you, you may get the sense that I am not, I do field work, I like doing field work. Um, I like interviewing people that nobody else wants to talk to, but I'm not the most blasé of field workers, right? So I gasp when I see Mussolini next to Mary, and I got excited about the priest, it's true. But that doesn't mean that it's, unthinkable. It just means that it goes against my assumptions, which is of course why I'm interested in my project. So we know it was the priest who came running out of his parish house to stop the vandals. I mean, this thing is, just to be very physical about it, it's very highly elevated. It's 14 meters tall, but it starts at like, I don't know, eight meters of height. So it wouldn't be an easy thing to begin with, but they were heading towards it when the priest runs out and he says no 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 so obviously he's long gone um i have interviewed people locally who, their take on it now is well because you know the mayor was gone the war was here because in fact the more the war was arriving um so he was the highest authority in town, and so they obeyed him. And so, but then it has to be simply an open question, and maybe there wouldn't even be a simple answer, but he could be protecting it as the mayor of the town who's just against any sort of vandalism. Or as the fascist priest, maybe. I mean, the, in a way, see, I think just saying priests are fascists or some of them are fascists, to me that's, forgive me, slightly facile because it, it takes us into fascist B in my current language, where it's very easy to call a lot of priests bullies and thugs, right? <laughs> so, but in Italy, first of all, starting in 1870, the Vatican and the state, which has been formed in 1861, are not on speaking terms. They were never married, but it's as though they were divorced. So from 1870 until 1929, there are no diplomatic relations in theory between the state, which by 1929 is a fascist state, and the church. Mussolini, who is now depicted by his devotees, and I find this wildly amusing, as having been a devout Catholic, was not a devout Catholic, and we know he was not a devout Catholic. This is a known thing, regardless of what the fanatics will tell you. But he did navigate, negotiate the Lateran Accords in 1929, this kind of reconciliation of church and state as states with the Vatican as a state, right? And so, so there's a lot of complicated and, and very um, uneven terrain having to do with the church's allegiance to Mussolini's state, particularly when it comes to Ethiopia. By the time Italy is attacking Ethiopia in 1935, and, and it really is kind of breathtaking, priests are giving sermons validating fascism as a movement sent by God. So in the space of six years, we go from not speaking terms to something that makes it unsurprising that for many Italians, Mussolini was semi-godly. So this is, so we can, there are all kinds of, there are all flavors of priests, right? Some of them really were anti-fascists. So the fact that this man protects the mosaic doesn't tell me anything about his politics, um, but it, he may be protecting the Virgin Mary who's in the image, he may like his building, he may need those young vandals to go and do something else, so. Okay, I want to let you know that we have a reception set up behind, so please stick around, but before we break for that, please join me in thanking Mia Fuller and Simonetta Falasca Tamponi.